Welcome to Reinventing Nerds. We have a really great opportunity today to have Dr. Tamsin Willie Barker, and she's a very special person, and you'll find out in just a second why I invited her to be on the show. But she's one of those people that is the essence of Reinventing Nerds. I mean, she is a very uh, scientific person, and yet she communicates her story is really well to people. So let me give you the, the rundown on what she does. Dr. Tamsin Willie Barker is an evolutionary biologist and anthropologist. She's also a businesswoman. So we'll hear a little bit about both of those. She combines these two skill sets to help companies unlock more innovation. Uh, she helps uh, work, make them better teams and greater sustainability by looking to nature for solutions. Her passion is helping leading edge growth companies innovate, collaborate, and grow by tapping nature's proven strategies. So welcome, Tasman. Hi. I'm so glad to have you here. And I want to tell everyone, too, that we have a book author on our show, and her book is titled Teeming, How Superorganisms Work to Build Infinite Wealth in a Finite World. And your company can too. So after the show, you might want to go and have a look at the teaming book, T E E M I N G. It's for those of you trying to get that on one of the uh, online places. So Tammy Tamsin, I'm combining teaming and and Tasman here. <laughs> <laughs> right, teaming Tasman. Yes, tell us. A little bit about what you do. Explain it in, in language that everyone can understand. All right. Well, um, I work with companies, and uh, my background is as an evolutionary biologist. And so I'll go into companies, and when they have a challenge, usually a product challenge, um, I will you know, say, well, how would nature do that? And then we'll look for examples in nature of organisms that have solved that. And of course, all those organisms have been doing it for 4 billion years, so they're really, really good solutions. So then we, we, we borrow those, we abstract them, and we put them into terms that um, are useful for a company, and we try to implement them. But uh, what I've discovered over time is that, um, you know, we come up with all these great ideas, and the engineers fall in love with them. But if the companies aren't adapted to change, if they aren't adapted to use those ideas, they don't uh, go anywhere. So I wrote that book. Um, with the intention of uh, how would nature design a company? Um, and so we can, you know, really start to put um, a more uh, systemic framework into place where we can really get some innovation going. Yeah, I mean, well, that's just a great way to put it. How would nature design a company? So there yeah. you go. There's Tasman in action right here, uh, giving us her, her human touch on this. So tell us a little bit about the book. I mean, it's hard to write a book that appeals to a general audience. I mean, that was your goal, right? To people right. and organizations. So you're writing about evolutionary biology and you're explaining it in terms that just the average person in a company, you know, has no, well, maybe they took a bio class in high school or college or maybe not, you know, uh, but you know, how do you, how did you do that? What, how, what, yeah. What challenge did you run into and how did you do that? Right. Well, you know, I mean, as a scientist, you know, everything's hypothesis driven. So we can never prove evolution exists. We just can't find any mm -hmm. evidence that contradicts it, you mm -hmm. know, and we're used to thinking it like that. But of course, lay people are not, you know, they are, our, our brains are really hard, hardwired to tell stories and to have linear right. narratives. So I've had to shift to that. And so I always try to start and also, I keep in mind that a lot of people were traumatized by science classes. <laughs> yeah. You know, so they're, these CEOs, they're, you know, their back goes up right away because they're like, nah, I failed that class, you know. <laughs> so they have a little intimidation factor. So I always try to meet them where they're at. You know, maybe they went camping with their dad when they were little or something like that. So, you know, meet them where they go. Oh, yeah, yeah. And everybody loves a good nature show. Um, and then I take them. Um, on a journey, you know, usually an adventure, like um, something they didn't know, take them to another world, you know, underwater or something like that, where I really grab their imagination and, and get them imagining what could things be like? How could, how could things be different? Um, and then I find, you know, the material super sexy. So people uh, really respond to that. And it hasn't, it, it's been surprisingly easy. 
Yeah, and I would say for the people who are viewing and listening, you need to get on to Tamsin's website because she's got these incredible videos of, of nature. They're just beautiful. And so that alone gets people mesmerized and uh, engaged in addition to what the messages that you are telling yeah. them. Yeah. So what feedback have you gotten from uh, people who've read your book that show that you have succeeded in getting that message out? Well, it was so cool. I launched the book and, you know, I didn't really know. It's an odd book, I'll tell you. But um, it, it launched and it went to the top 10 in um, organizational design and um, economics or environmental economics. But yeah. the same day it went to top 10 in ecology and animal behavior. So it's really, you know, I think that means I succeeded in hitting both audiences. So, um, so hopefully that's the case, but it's, it's almost sold out. We've almost sold 3000 copies Wow! and yeah. And it's really, um, people seem to really respond, um, in these companies, you know, I mean, like I'm, I'm working with Google and Facebook and, um, they seem to really get it. Um, which, you know, even three years ago, I, they were like, what? Uh, but now I'm really seeing that the, the mindset's there. Yeah. So how do you, what, what? manifest for you to be able to see that they're getting it how do you see that in somebody um well you know I, i'll talk about ants and, and bees and how they make their decisions and how suddenly a line will form and they go get the food and 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 these kind of communication things they use and because they work in those networks and we're you know over the last whatever 50 years but especially accelerating over time um, we've moved into this network space and, and getting our minds around working in networks um, when we're used to working in these kind of more linear um, hierarchies. Um, because we're doing that in our daily lives now, people are looking for another framework and it suddenly it clicks, like everything seems to make sense. Wow. So p people really bring it to their own experience too, to understand what you're saying. I mean, I think that's just generally true with a communication strategy is that people have to bring it into their own frame of reference to Absolutely. get it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're starting with that, you know, finding out like what people are comfortable with, not what they're traumatized with. Right. Well, like, you know, and when you, when you talk to people, they're like, Oh, I mean, 70% of people aren't that engaged in their work. 25% of people hate their work. Mm. Um, you know, and why is that? It's because we don't get to work with the people we like. We don't get to do what we want the way we think we should. You know, it's, it's super basic, um, stuff like a, the way we like to work in our personal lives. We don't get to work that way at work. Mm -hmm. So, um, people are like, oh yeah, I get that. You know, they're like, my work could be so much better, um, with just, if I could just do things the way I want to do them. So yeah. people respond. Okay. And also it gives them some hope that there's something better. Oh, that's the other thing is, you know, a lot of the work I do is around sustainability because these organisms, every solution is, you know, at room temperature with grown from sunlight and CO2. And um, so it's very helpful and it's very optimistic. And it's like, well, if these species have solved that, why can't we? There's no reason why not, you know, and we yeah. know that the ant biomass is roughly the same as the human biomass. Um, but they don't. Wait, what does that mean? <laughs> yeah, they, you know, if they, if they, if all the ants together tied in a sack would weigh about the same as all of humanity. Oh, so the total um, mass of ants and humans. Yes. Oh, okay. So their, wow. their metabolic needs are roughly similar, um, mm -hmm. but they're not sitting in traffic and causing, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, <laughs> so it, it's really optimistic because it's like, oh, well, so if they did it, why can't we? No reason why not. You know, so we is, start yeah. there. That is so interesting because I, I don't, I just see the humans looking like ants so often when you get this, this <laughs> yeah. aerial view of traffic, right? Especially if you're in an airplane, you're looking down, you're going, well, those are just like lines of ants. But the thing is with the ants, they're moving, right? Yeah. <laughs> we're just sitting, sitting there. there. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I haven't thought of that before that, yeah, they, uh -huh. actually, they have a system that works as opposed to us. We're all clogged up and uh, yeah. trying to battle. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. But it's, I mean, what's the difference? It's pretty simple. You know, they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're, you know, plants make, you know, materials and energy, you mm -hmm. know, from the sun and from the atmospheric carbon and, and things that are around at room temperature. 
um, and then the, yeah. the ants live off that. And if they can't digest cellulose, they partner with a fungus that can. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's not rocket science, and they've stumbled on it by accident. Um, and that's and kind of how nature too. works, right? I mean, exactly. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. So, all right. So we've talked about your book and communicating in your book to people. I mean, what other kinds of interactions do you have with people? You know, what, how would you describe, you know, your typical uh, people interactions? Are you giving talks? Are you consulting yeah. in companies? Are you working one-on-one -on -one with people? What are you doing? Mm -hmm. Well, I've been doing a lot of keynotes um, mm -hmm. and, you know, really at a pretty high level talking to CEOs of mm -hmm. enterprises and uh, a lot of Fortune 500 companies. But I also, you know, I've been doing that um, product design work, uh, working with R&D teams and okay. engineers for about 10 years. Um, okay. And so now I'm really kind of transitioning more into the organizational design space. So I do, I do the keynotes, I do workshops. Um, I'm doing, starting to do retreats uh, where I take uh, corporate groups to Catalina and I'm partnering with the uh, USC Marine Lab over there. So we take them, you know, we get the microscopes, we go kayaking, we look at barnacles, whatever, and we look at those, those nature solutions. And then we work through their challenges that way. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing that and then, um, um, work and do more consulting. Um, and that's the goal. You know, I have to say, Tamsin, you have the passion that shows through that you can make looking at barnacles fun. I mean, it's serious. Awesome. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I mean, wow, we just, yeah, we need to bring our kids along too. Like, go look at nature. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Because you're just like, how are they doing that? Well, why don't we do that? You know? Yeah. Uh, oh. I mean, that's a yeah, and you're asking that's the right a question. perfect. Yeah, that's a perfect example because there's a you know when you go to Home Depot and you buy your wood, it's all um, FSC certified. And and how that started was there's a guy, an engineer, uh, and he worked for Columbia Forest Products, and he you know they work with a lot of formaldehydes and toxic glues to hold that plywood together. He's walking along the beach in Oregon and he sees all these barnacles stuck to the rocks. Um, and mussels and things like that. And he's like, well, how do they do it? You know, they've got a glue that works in water, underwater. So he went yeah. and looked at it, broke down the, the protein, mimicked it, and now that all the wood you buy in Home Depot uses that technology. So perfect example of biomimicry. Wow. Yeah, wow, that sounds so much better for the environment. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Oh, wow, so getting people to even just think well, sort of outside the box, right? Just yeah. to sort of ask the right questions as a start. So what have you done? I mean, you've, you've moved in from, I mean, I'm assuming, you know, getting your PhD in uh, biology and studying anthropology is a lot of very focused research oriented work. And now you're out there giving keynote speeches and you're helping design products. So how, what have you done to improve your communication skills along the way? Right. Well, I mean, I, I had always done a lot of writing, but I, mm -hmm. what I started out with was, you know, I mean, when you write for a scientific audience, when you're writing papers, you know, everything's about being objective and passive yeah. voice and very, you know, not emotional. Um, but, you know, when you write for a general audience, you have to have a narrative, you have to grab them. Um, so that's been a process, you know, um, learning that it's okay you know, let, let go, yes. yeah. <laughs> let go of that. But you have to be accurate, you know, and a lot of times I'm dealing with the R&D teams and engineers really care about, you know, the, the, the accuracy. Um, and so that does matter, being true to the science. Uh, and sometimes it's a hard line to, work, to walk, to, to, to put forth an idea in a real clear way uh, with a story um, and make it compelling while at the same time being true to the science. It's not always the easiest thing um, to do, but I, I've acquired it. I, I started out um, writing a blog, uh, Bioinspired Inc, 10 mm -hmm. years ago, and then that was discovered by a design magazine. So I started writing a column for them, and then that was discovered by a, a green business magazine, Green Biz, um, and I started writing for them. So you can find a lot of my stuff on inhabitat.com and mm -hmm. uh, greenbiz.com. Mm -hmm. um, but, but it really t taught me how to appeal to a mainstream audience and how to translate those ideas. 
Okay. So over time, it took a bit of time to it did. finesse yeah. that. And it sounds to me like you also put a lot of thought and energy into creating a story that is compelling and accurate at the same time without, you know, just That's slapping right. something out that, you know, on the wall and hoping it sticks, you know? Yeah. No, I mean, this has been a long time in the making, you know, a, a lot of um, all these concepts are rooted in things that actually happened to me, you know, because I, I was an anthropologist. I worked in the field. I was a primatologist. So studying baboons in Ethiopia and living in a tent right. and, you know, having mm -hmm. these great experiences. But I, you know, I was trying to make sense of the patterns I was seeing. Um, and so it's really kind of organically grown out of some pretty cool stories. So it's not that hard um, to make that translation. Yeah, interesting. Um, all right, so when you, I'm still focusing on some of the, the people strategies. You know, what's your biggest challenge for you personally? What's, what's hardest for you? Oh, for me personally, I'm, I'm introverted and I like, it's really ironic because I, I write about collaboration, but I'm, I, you know, it started because I'm like, how do people do that? Yeah. <laughs> I like to work alone. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, that's my personal challenge, you know, and um, I've done a lot of uh, leadership coaching in, in during this transition phase, you know, getting from pure science to biomimicry. And uh, one of the things I really learned was dealing with introverts, you know, techniques for that. So that, um, and especially true for engineers, like giving them opportunities to, um, think about the questions, think about their contributions beforehand. So I always encourage, you know, the clients that I'm working with to, to email the agenda beforehand and set an expectation of two contributions or something like that so that people get a chance to think their way, you know, to use their, their approach. Um, and, and um, you know, because so many times the introverts get cut out, um, because they, they're thinking in a different way or, um, you know, not as quickly, right. those sorts of things. So I think it's really important to get, you know, and, and of course, we, you know, coming from the teaming perspective, the biological perspective, the bees, everybody speaks up, the ants, everybody speaks up. So it's really important to set those kind of expectations uh, expectation if you want to get that collective intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's sort of grown out of my own introversion and what would help me contribute um, to collaborative setups. Wow, that's, that's really interesting to leverage that and, and to be sensitive to other people's needs as well. Yeah. What do you do when you're working with a really extroverted audience? Uh, it was, it's interesting because I, I, you know, for a long time I worked with um, scientists that were trying to move into executive roles. So I was yeah. trying to teach them like how do you uh you know they didn't have management skills a lot of times their people skills were a little mm -hmm. um fuzzy but now i go into these you know entrepreneur room of 1200 entrepreneurs and they're shouting things out they don't <laughs> care <laughs> they don't care what's accurate they just yeah. you know they're just really grabbed by a story and bottom line um and a lot of energy but they're, that's fun for me because then they're they're contributing and we can get um, something going and I don't I don't mind dealing with that kind of um, energy oh excellent so you're pretty versatile there yeah I mean of course you have to learn how to hey buddy you've been <laughs> contributing too much over there <laughs> yeah, shut yeah people down yeah that's right that's uh, right in a way that's respectful and keeps them happy right if they're that's honest. right yeah yes Oh man. So let me ask you, I would love for you to share one of your stories with our audience. I mean, I, I don't know if you have one that you just love to share or you think would be appropriate for the Reinventing Nerds podcast. I mean, I think our listeners would and viewers would want to hear a little bit about uh, one of your nature things. I mean, there's the ants, there are the bees, there's the fungi, you know, okay. pick one and tell us a little bit about how that relates to All right. uh, some an organizational issue. Okay. I, I'll, I'll do the waggle dance. So oh, I love this is the, the honeybees. Okay. And, yeah, this is a good one. Okay. So, so how they, so, when conditions are good and the, and the hive is grown, some of the hive is going to need to go and find a new home. So the way they do it is the entire swarm goes off and sits on a branch and just waits there. 
but then all the scout bees, who are kind of a, a, a cast of um, bees that, that specialize in that. And they go out in this starburst pattern and they're uh, looking for suitable homes. And when they find one, they'll, they'll, they actually take 40 minutes to uh, measure it, make sure it can store enough honey for the winter. And they, is it dry? All that sort of thing. And if they like it, they go back to the hive and they'll do a waggle dance, which tells all the other bees where it is. So they'll tell them, um, you know, with their dance, go this direction, this far, and the vigor of the dance tells the other bees how good they think it is. And so then they'll, they'll convince other bees to go visit. So you get these, re and they'll come back and do the same thing. So you get these amplifying uh, loops that increase the good signals and then poorer sites fade away and disappear. Right. Um, and so you get this dance floor of all these different things. It looks really chaotic, but then they hit some threshold trip, uh, tipping point and the whole hive will fly. And, and the whole thing depends on the diversity of all these different opinions and this competition of ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that every bee can contribute what they what they saw, and that they never uh, believe fake news. No. <laughs> they always, they they always no bee, no bee will vote for a site they haven't personally seen. Um, interesting. And almost no bees see more than one site. That's the interesting thing. Wait, so they always vote for their own? The one That's that right. <laughs> but if they don't think it's that good, they just don't vote. <laughs> <laughs> okay. They just kind of, uh, um, and so you get this amplification of the good ones, okay. and then it just flips. So it's really fascinating, and I've got some companies that are trying to implement that collective intelligence process mm -hmm. in their in their own um, uh, methods. I have a I'm working with a company that does uh, corporate surveys, large corporate surveys mm -hmm. uh, from employees, and helps the companies figure out what. What they should be doing and so they base it on this way well, they dance like that uh it's just pretty cool so they get people's opinions and then they sort of see where uh yeah. the energy is from everybody yeah and you can think of uh quora how you upvote mm -hmm. things so you get you know the experts and the good ideas rise to the top um it's a similar kind of Oh, that makes a lot of sense. I don't know. I was hoping you would do the waggle dance, but that's okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they do their waggle dance. I got to do that. They, right. Yeah, they do. They wiggle their bodies, right? That's, what that's right. Yeah, yeah. So in the future, we'll be voting for presidents this way. <laughs> oh, oh, no. We'll just be all out there. Mm, uh, yeah, no. <laughs> I don't like your dance. <laughs> How about this dance? <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, I like that actually. A different way of voting. Yeah. Uh, it would actually simplify the system quite a bit, right? <laughs> oh man. So you, I wonder what kind of advice you would have. I mean, you're the real science, hardcore science, evolutionary biology, as well as anthropology. You know, what advice do you have for other scientists who are trying to reach people outside of that field to share their messages? Right. Well, um, I would definitely focus on a story. And I would definitely try to try to put yourself in the shoes of your audience. You know, where are they coming from? Um, and remember that they they may be a little intimidated, a little turned off by science. So you have to uh, hit them. Start somewhere where they're comfortable, and you know maybe that's um, something cool they saw. You know, or an interesting story, a, a little nature show, whatever. Um, or maybe it's you know. Uh, neurobiology or whatever stories you have, but, but people really do think in terms of these narrative stories. So if you can get them there, if you can meet them somewhere comfortable and you can take them on an interesting journey um, and, and bring them back with something new where they're going, oh, never th thought about that. Uh, that's pretty effective, I think. Yeah, well, that actually sounds like something, a new message though that I really loved was this, the comfort piece, starting yeah. With them in a place because there's an intimidation factor with science. That's right. And putting them at ease. Like I'm not going, cause a lot of times they're already like, I don't, I can't do it. Right. And, and they're, sh they're mm -hmm. shutting down. So, so that, but also when you're communicating, um, trying to, uh, put some energy into it, you know, we we're used to as scientists using the passive voice, mm -hmm. um, you know, try to really get in the habit of using the active voice. 
you know, take out your was being, he was doing those kind of things. Yes. Um, try to, try to get direct. You know, my rule of thumb is I take out all the that's that just doesn't help. So, and it just makes things move a little quicker. <laughs> I had an editor do that for me once. Yeah. She's like, you don't need the that. So I was like, but that you supposed to have them in there. <laughs> you don't do anything. Yeah. Uh-huh. Now, I love your story about writing too, because I tell you when uh, I was in graduate school and I was writing my dissertation, as you said, when you're writing up science, it has to be really precise and objective. And you know, I was used to being out in the real world first, you know, I didn't go straight oh. through to grad school. So I was making it interesting. You know, I would, you always been taught, like, don't use the same word, every paragraph, things like that. And one of my committee members was like, no, if you use a different word, it means something different. You have to use the <laughs> same word. It has to be precise. And I said, but I want it to be interesting. He goes, it's not supposed to be interesting. <laughs> it's just the facts, ma'am. I was like, Oh, oh. Very, like big, you know, that was a big conversion for me. And then after I got the PhD, I had to like go back out and relearn, you know, how to appeal to a general audience. It was a lot yeah. of work in both ways. I mean, you can, you can really see how um, our different personalities respond to one way or the other, you know, and if you try to uh, take that, that, that dry approach with, you know, most people, they're just, they just are not interested. Yeah. So it's really easy to see how you can turn people off with this. And it goes yeah. both ways. And, and I noticed that you also take a, like I said before, a multimedia approach. I mean, you have these videos that are playing in the background or images or that you show, you take a little break during your talks because in today's world, people want that. I mean, they're used to like this really quick attention span as well. So you've got a right. lot going on to keep people engaged. Right. And, and the other thing mm -hmm. is I, you know, I've discovered that really, if you can, you know, give them one message, three supporting con, you know, ideas that support that, and then let them talk about it a little bit so mm -hmm. that it sinks in and that they connect it to their own experience. Um, they're going to remember it a lot better. So I try to do that because, you know, and that's the other thing is like, I coming from a science background, all my courses were lectures, you know, you oh, just sit there and you receive and you mm -hmm. take notes. Um, and that's not how most people learn. They, they need that interactive and they need to process mm -hmm. it through their own experience. Uh, so that's been something I've had to learn. Oh, that's interesting. Even just a normal conversation with somebody, just having a little yeah. back and forth rather than just getting like, you know, I've, my daughter will kind of glaze over when I get into sort of professor mode, you know, like, oh, here comes the lecture. I mean, yeah. people at work are the same way. <laughs> they don't want the lecture. <laughs> yeah. But it's funny because, you know, I, I, when I'm working with the engineer audiences, they, I used to go, they just don't like me, um, you know, because they're not, I'll ask a question and it's just deadpan. And I realized like they actually are really comfortable with the lecture. They like the lecture. They like just writing down the notes, you know, and processing it in their own way and, and they're comfortable. And I personally am that way too. I don't, right. I like that. Um, so, but yeah. most people are not. Yeah. Knowing your audience. I mean, that's, that's it. the battle, right? I mean, so that's you've got it. the people who want that. That's what you deliver. And you've got the other folks who want to be shouting out in the middle. <laughs> you know, you yeah. it, and, and, you know, you get these Tony Robbins guys that are like, come on, we're going to do that. You know, I'm like, oh, I got it. Where's the exit? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, right. Right. So figure out your style too. I've also noticed yeah. that you've um, uh, managed to stay extremely authentic, true to yourself, and figure out how to portray that to people and, and communicate that to people. So it, you're comfortable up there, even if you're an introvert dealing with extroverts or you know whatever it is that you find yeah. a way that works for you. And that's what this reinventing nerds is all about: is finding a way that works for you. Yeah, well, honestly, I just love my subject matter so much um, that, and I just am like, you got, wait till you get a load of this. <laughs> wait <till> you, <laughs> you know, I just want to share it. So that um, yeah. goes a long way. And I think, you know, the passion can, can carry through uh, a lot of other things uh, that might be working against you. So, 
Wow. Well, I'm going to wrap it up on that note because I mean, I can tell the passion just definitely shows through with you and your message and you're right. Even if you're having fun and it's what you love to do, it doesn't matter. You know, everything else is good because at least you're doing what you love to do. So I love what I do. Yeah. Best job ever. Yeah. Wow. Well, Tamson, thank you so much for sharing your strategies there and your success stories because uh, the people who are scientists who are listening in or watching us are saying, wow, you know, I, I really getting some of these messages. They're really key simple ones that you said. It's about making people comfortable. It's about telling stories and letting them interact with you so that they really uh, solidify the message. So that that's something that anyone can take away. So thank you for, for giving that away. Yes. And thank you, Joni. Yeah. And go to uh, Tamsin's website, get her book. Her website is drtamsin.com. That's com. right. And, and the audiobook is coming out in August. And then we've got a workbook for guiding people through the process. Excellent. So even if you don't have time for a read, you can put it on while you're driving to work and your commute and listening to her fabulous stories um, yes. that are very approachable. <laughs> They're fun. They're good. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Tamsin. And uh, thanks to our listeners and our viewers. We'd love it if you would subscribe to the show, rate and review it, and uh, continue listening in to reinventingnerds.com.